Hello everybody and today I'm with Mark from Canda and we're going to be having a look at SEO. Now for many of us, um, SEO, we might not even know what it stands for, but if we do, it might seem a bit confusing. We get conflicting signals, we get those emails in our inbox saying, oh yes, can you uh, sign up for this and that and we'll get your website to the top of Google within a week. Or you get other people who say, oh, uh, SEO, oh, don't worry about that. Just put some nice content out there. So, Mark, <laughs> who should we listen to and why? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it's it's hard, I think, to answer. Interestingly, I actually recorded last week a podcast with a, a chap named um, Daniel Foley Carter, and we discussed the the downsides, disadvantages, the dangers of business owners and marketers kind of learning SEO from social media and mm. who can they who can they trust when you see someone posting some advice and like you say, you'll see someone else maybe say something exactly opposite a week later and yeah. everyone seems legitimate. And I think that's one of the, the difficult things about SEO is that there's no real bar to entry. Anyone that says they are an SEO <laughs> until they prove they're not they are one. So it's, it's like an innocent that's all proven guilty, at least I think with things like websites and web design uh, photography, you can at least very clearly look at someone's work and make some judgment there as to if you like it or the standard. So I think the, the, the most basic advice that everyone should do is if you actually Google, the, so do the Google search for Google choosing an SEO, Google gives you some basic guidelines um, and they're obviously a good non-biased kind of source, at least for choosing an SEO. And they mentioned things like actually something you said, which is to be wary of SEO firms that email you out of the blue. Mm -hmm. So that's not really what I would class like a normal behavior for an SEO consultant or agency. We don't tend to just randomly email people and ask them for, for work. And one I actually encountered this week with, um, with a colleague at another agency was they were pitching against someone, another agency who said they had a special relationship with Google that oh, could really? help them uh -huh. rank faster. <laughs> yeah. And again, this is something Google specifically mentions in this guide to actually link them to that and said, show the client this, because although there are certain partner programs for Google around their paid advertising, there's no type of relationship an agency can have with Google that's going to impact their organic ranking. So that's like a huge red flag. If someone is claiming that to me, it's immediately off the list. And, and lastly, um, it's, you know, the advice Google gives there lastly, they've got several other bits is to just be clear about actually what they're going to do. Because, you know, if you don't understand what they're doing, um, you can get yourself into a bad situation pretty quickly. So apart from what you're trying to achieve, you should really clearly understand what that actually um, involves. My personal litmus test is then with anything, because that might scare people if they say, well, what are they going to do? And you're like, well, I don't understand it. Mm. The litmus test is nothing should be done for SEO that's going to harm or detract from the user experience. So if people start suggesting putting content on your site that doesn't sound right or doing something that is in some way going to impede your users, then again, that's like a, that's a big no for me. So those are, the, those are, the, I guess, are the, the absolute basics that I would tick off before um, deciding who to, who to listen to and engage, you know, who you engage with. If you actually wanted to hire an SEO is another thing. The only advice I'd give there is speak to their existing clients, like three or four of them. Yeah. Yeah. Cut, cut through everything, ask for their clients, and don't just make it one or two because everyone's got a friend that will say they did a great job. Oh, yeah. So three or four <laughs> yeah. and hear from them. What results did they get? What did they charge you? Yeah. And you can't go far wrong. I think if you're, you're speaking to the clients. It seems to be one of those areas where a little knowledge is dangerous, almost worse than knowing nothing. If you've got just that little glimpse behind the scenes that you think you therefore know what's going on. Uh, and that then makes it quite difficult for people to actually hire someone in because they can get so duped by, by this because you'll you'll get a, a, that those one of those emails coming through saying, oh, I've picked up this this error and that error and the other on your website and you haven't got the right links and so on. And some of those words are enough for people to connect to and think, oh, I understand that and I think I need that. So, yeah, I mean, I suppose that does does then raise the question is, do you try and educate your 
your customers to understand enough so that they know what they're buying because it can be like that with photography to an extent yes you can see it but sometimes people don't necessarily appreciate some of the nuances of crafting something uh, to produce something which is high end as opposed to just acceptable yeah definitely so 100 percent agree a little bit of knowledge is is dangerous and you know again some agencies will be very pushy like you've said using technical terms and again i actually published a phone call that i received from an seo agency that had emailed me about one of my websites saying oh there's all these things wrong with it you you need to see our audit and i replied to them from my work email address that says it's Canda, which is obviously a digital agency with my job description which is you know director of digital marketing and i just said to them look be honest you don't you won't have anything in that audit i'm interested in and they responded to that with um a a link to for me in my calendar to, to have a call with them to discuss the audit so i thought okay fine i will have this call with them and it essentially descended into them telling me to rank in google um, i need to let them host content on my site that's invisible to users and can only be seen by Google and links to their websites, mm. which again, that probably didn't mean a lot um, if you don't know a lot about SEO, but um, you know, it breaks my rule of, is it good? You know, is it, is it harmful? For the, is it harmful for the user experience? Hiding stuff, content from users makes no sense. Mm. And us linking to them is almost like the opposite of SEO. If you like really what you're trying to achieve is getting other websites to talk about you, write about you link to you to show to send users to you to show search engines that um that you're trusted so even if you know and we got quite technical on that call so i was told things like that the text to html ratio on my website was incorrect and it needed to be 50 50 it needed to be balanced which again is is garbage and (laughs) you know so Yes, a little bit of knowledge is dangerous. Locally, we actually set up um, an event called Search Norwich, which we invited businesses to um, every two months. And we had SEO and PPC people come and talk. And the idea was companies could educate themselves in a non-sales environment. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I do think getting a level of knowledge is very important. And I think also getting that knowledge in a non-sales environment is important. So learning from people that aren't trying to sell you something. There are some options now if you if um, if you are in a company and, you know, you've got a significant budget you want to put to SEO and for whatever reason, you don't have someone on your team that's knowledgeable. You can actually hire people now to help you with that procurement process. So there are a few people now acting, for instance, as freelance SEOs that will help you interview and vet agencies. Mm. But um, I would again, if you don't have the knowledge, I would say don't even get involved in those technical conversations, speak to the clients because you want to know just what comes out the other end, really. That's what's important to you. Are they going to get results and what did it cost? If you want to understand more about what is happening, then really I would pull in experts because it's going to be worth the money because SEO is a long-term investment, you know, so Mm -hmm. this isn't one thing you're buying and you can return. You're going to put money into it. You're not going to see that money again. So you want to make sure you're getting the most for it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I've I've found it useful, sort of. Um, although I don't necessarily contribute, but dipping into kind of expert conversations when they're going on uh, online, you can kind of pick up little bits and pieces. There's your unsolicited SEO tips that I, that I know you put out on, on LinkedIn, and that interaction you then get between people who 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 uh, run SEO agencies and so on, you that then starts to weed out perhaps some of the uh, some of the chat in there. Um, I think um, I'd like to move on to having a little bit of a think about a particular aspect. I mean, from my point of view of being a photographer, obviously the main thing that I'm interested in most of the time is images. And what I want to do is be able to help my clients to get the most out of their images. Um, Now, whenever you look at things like website audits and people talk about SEO on a superficial level, it tends to be very quickly going into talking about technical tags. Have you got an H1 tag, H2 tag, all these kinds of things. And it's very text focused. So I was wondering, could you suggest some ways in which images relate to um, SEO, please? Yeah, certainly. So that's interesting. I think the, the conversations that start around SEO naturally 
start with the kind of technical stuff because that's a finite job and it's an amplifier for, for everything else you do. And um, just to caveat it, sometimes if the technical stuff is really bad, which is fairly rare nowadays, if you're using a well-known sort of CMS like WordPress or Shopify or something like that, it's, it's, it's rare, it's going to be really bad, but it can block everything else happening. And in terms of audits, um, hopefully most SEO agencies are doing different types of audits. So for instance, we do a technical audit, right? Which will cover like the things you've mentioned, like geeky stuff. And then there are content audits, which look at everything else, which is like you said, text, um, it can be video, it can be images. So content, I think it's important to immediately break that thought that when people think content, they think text, right? Because it mm. can be anything people can see and, and get value from. And then we've got other types of audits we do like link audits and things like that. And all these play a part in SEO. But if we focus on the content stuff, because that's where images fit in. Yeah. Um, as, as I see images as that mix of content, they've really got three things they do, which is we can drive traffic directly from search engines, from image search. And I think that's massively underestimated, especially for e-commerce sites. Um, again, this morning I was on a call with an e-commerce uh, client and they get a huge amount of traffic from Google images. Oh, wow. So that is people searching for their type of products. And rather than click on individual websites that are ranking, people go to images and just scroll down this list of images until they see things that they like, and then they click on the image. And you probably know this better than I do date-wise. I think it was a year or two ago, Google actually removed this button called view image from their image results, which means now to see the image, you have to basically go to the site. Mm. So actually we drive a lot of traffic through that. And shopping especially is a really visual activity. You know, we've been trained over, um, I guess generations, you know, we go and just look at stuff. We scan stuff that is of interest to us. It's not as natural uh, picking through search results. So image search is hugely um, important. What's a great and opportunity then, to stand out then, that sounds like. If people are searching in Google images and they want to look at something, if they see a manky picture of something or a really glossy, good looking one, which one they're going to click on? <laughs> Well, this, this is built in actually to um, some of the different types of algorithms, because, again, there, there isn't just one Google algorithm, right? There's lots of different algorithms working together. So, for instance, there is a um, uh, an app. Uh, well, the Google app has Google Discover and Google Discover, for those that haven't used it, essentially surfaces um, website stories that it thinks you'll be interested in. It's almost like predicting what your next search is going to be. Okay. And there are things you can do to optimize for Discover. And one of them is Google specifies you need high resolution images to appear in Google Discover. To you know, you are much less likely to appear, if at all, if you've got some grainy, you know, 600 pixel wide images. They want high res images that are going to be able to to look good on all devices. And Google Discover. Um, although it's very um, spiky in terms of traffic, so you get featured, can drive huge amounts of traffic. Mm -hmm. So, and this links closely actually to the, the next kind of point. So I said, there's three things about it, which is, you know, good quality images add to the overall experience of that content. Um, images, you know, it's, it's documented to the point of boredom, how images impact conversion rates. You know, people want good images um, and it helps people actually buy. And, while um, there's a lot of misinformation about exactly how Google, what Google's measuring in terms of these um, user signals, user experience signals, certainly it's helping if people are going to your site, staying on it and buying and not coming back and clicking lots of other places, you're showing you're satisfied with that result. So those, those two things are kind of, it adds to, I think the quality of the page and Google has lots of ways it can monitor that um, and it helps improve conversion rate. Mm. Yeah. Well, I mean, so I suppose then we could say if I'm choosing images for a website as a business owner, um, what what matters most then? If I was to think of it for the moment from an SEO sort of angle, uh, what might influence how I choose my images? Yeah, so I think the most common, I wouldn't say it's a mistake, but um, missed opportunity, if you like. Mm -hmm. is people automatically going for stock imagery. And uh, there's a couple of reasons for this, which is if you go to Google now and type 
something in and then like eclipse or something that's going to show you pictures yeah and you look at images what you will not see is the same image over and over again in the search results and that's hopefully an obvious reason why you know if it's not helpful once it's not going to be helpful twice now obviously the the issue with stock imagery is that you're not the only person using them so if you're relying on stock imagery you're essentially <laughs> pretty much killing all chance you've got of ranking well in Google images, because there's probably someone before you that's using that, that Google's happy ranking that image there for. So the, the first thing I'd say is, you know, look to get your own, um, your own photography done. And to, in terms of images in general, there's two things I like to look at, which is you can get really strong hints as to where images will be particularly helpful from doing a Google search. So for a client we work with, the search term I know off the top of my head, problem solving techniques, mm -hmm. um, will not just show you a list of websites, normally at the top of that result are some diagrams, some images. So I'm already informed by Google then that the most helpful type of content here is, is imagery because right. that's getting the idea across. And the same with um, another good example someone spoke to me about once was people searching for things like, what is the height of the London, the Shard, right? right. Because, because, you know, the answer is like, I think 200 something meters. But unless you know, <laughs> some people can't picture what 200 meters is, right? Mm -hmm. So if you did an image showing, here's the Shard next to, I don't know, um, if you're from France, maybe the Eiffel Tower or, you know, some common landmarks, an image is a really good way to demonstrate the height, like subjectively. So yeah. there's, there's all these different uses for photography and imagery that, as I said, improve, they, they help fulfill that intent. And all of SEO really is about fulfilling user intent. So yeah, what should we consider when we're considering photography? Of course, not stock photography where we can. Um, we should consider all the different um, use cases for imagery and photos, apart from here are some photos of our product, you know? Yeah. And then as well, as we said, like the actual, the actual quality. There are There is some technical stuff as well. Um, so you can actually do, you can use things called image sitemaps which is essentially a big list of all your images for search engines. So that negates the need for them to have to like crawl around and explore your site for them and maybe miss some. You can actually just say, look, here are all my images. And again, that, that can help you rank well. Yeah, oh, great. Uh, you, you, you come back quite often to this sort of the, the, the user experience of interacting with the website. And you're saying you know, SEO is more about building on that. So I suppose it leads quite nicely into what my next question was going to be, what kind of mistakes can we fall into then? What kind of pitfalls there are? Um, I guess the most basic one that I see clients miss is around uh, image compression, which is they get these beautiful photos done. And then sometimes you have like a four megabyte image on a page, which um, again, four megabytes, just to give you some, some, uh, context if if you don't know what that means if you used to use little floppy disks it's like three or four of them full of information <laughs> but and on a on a 3g connection that's going to take you probably the best part of 30 seconds to a minute to maybe download that um, so again it comes down to user experience right about these pictures so there are all kinds of solutions to um, site performance is key images can can drastically impact that so compression um and i'm sure again joe this is probably a subject you know more about than me but generally there's two types of image compression there's lossless and lossy mm -hmm. so lossless yeah. is essentially when you make the file size of the image so not actually necessarily the, the size of the image but the the file size so how long it takes to download smaller by stripping away um stripping away information that doesn't need to be there that's not visual so for instance a lot of photos attached i believe like um it's called exif data which is like what camera was used and sometimes that on phones where it was taken and you don't need to know that and it takes up space so you can get rid of that and lossy compression yeah and lossless compression means there's no dim difference in the image quality loss lossy is when you compress the image size with an algorithm so it essentially um guesses 
or computes what some parts should look like. So at the extreme end, if you look at old images on the internet, you see these very fuzzy JPEGs that look like someone's wiped Vaseline on your screen. And that's <laughs> yeah. the extreme yeah. end of, yeah. of lossy. But Google actually changed its recommendations um, a few years ago now from using lossless to using lossy compression because at the at the high at the well the low end of compression of lossy you the the actual difference to the user is almost imperceptible um, and you can shave significant file size off so having your content management system maybe manage that for you is is, is really helpful so you get this best um, site performance as well um, and again, I think it, I think I kind of already mentioned these points really is around um, the sitemaps, not using stock imagery. And, and lastly, when when you're getting these images ready, um, no doubt the conversation of alt text will come up if you're talking about SEO. And, and alt text is essentially labeling the image with some text. And it's primarily actually for accessibility reasons. So this is people maybe um, who are partially sighted and using a screen reader. Um, and it's describing what the, the, the contents of the image is. Now, interestingly, search engines still do use alt text to help them decide um, what's in an image, but they have come so far now with their actual analysis of what goes on in image results specifically. So there's, if you do a Google search for Google Vision API, there's a free service you can like upload a picture to uh -huh. and Google will, will tell you what's in the photo. And the accuracy nowadays I find creepy. So it, it won't just say like, there's a dog in this photo. It will say golden retriever in this picture. That's impressive. I think we're all going to want to go and try that now. That's <laughs> yeah, because people it's... used to say, well, if you've got to have an alt tag there, because Google can't see the picture, all it sees is here's a bunch of data that makes up a picture. You know, so if you don't put in the alt tag, if you don't tell it what the picture is of, it doesn't know. Well, so in a way that's no longer true. Yeah, absolutely. And this is, you know, this, this is really um, as well demonstrated by how good Google safe search is now, because it's very, um, it's very rare you accidentally like get adult pictures if you've got safe search on. And part of that is in image recognition that it's working out what's in these pictures that it maybe doesn't want to show. Mm -hmm. um, now, and that, that's certainly not saying don't do alt tags because, you know, the number one reason you should be doing them is for accessibility, you know, and there, there's legal requirements around making websites accessible and there are benefits to it and search engines still do use it. I'm just saying it's not the be all and end all for them working out what is in a photo. The, the, other, the other kind of thing is there is ways to automate that now as well. So you can actually use those vision services. So Microsoft has one where if you've got 10,000, <clears> excuse me, 10,000 images, you can actually get an AI to attempt to write those tags for you and then you can review them. Hmm. That's pretty smart there. <laughs> I, um, I suppose then people are going to think, well, there's an awful lot of work that, uh, that goes into all this, so many things to consider. Um, I, and one way that people can often think, well, they might be able to keep the cost down by giving you the information, giving you what you need in the best possible format. So you're not wasting time on things. Uh, are there any recommendations that you would make? So if someone wanted to, to work with you, any recommendations you would make as to how people can make your job easier, uh, make it more efficient for the whole process as to how they deliver the images and that to you? Yeah, again, I have one of my litmus test golden rules for this. <laughs> and it was a piece of advice I was given a long time ago, which is um, if you're using a computer to do a repetitive task, you're using the computer wrong. <laughs> and I've loved that piece of advice because it's held true for me for a lot of years. So um, what we can do to make things easier for, for both of us is Firstly, don't make the photography like an afterthought because there's, you know, there's nothing worse than us working with someone on an e-com site and then, yeah, quarter of the products don't have any photography and the rest is kind of rushed and, it, it, you know, it's negatively impacting everything. So make sure this is part of all of the discussions as you're building the site or relaunching it or whatever you're doing. It's part of your plans. If you have big repetitive tasks to do, like oh no, we've got 10,000 images and we've got, we know we need to do the, these alt tags. Mm -hmm. um, that's when you have a discussion with someone like us because you know, I'm not going to tell you that we're going to sit there and write them for you because that's a terrible 
use of you know an expert's time because you're paying them obviously a premium to sit and do what's a fairly simple task but that's maybe where we could say okay well if we've got this many to do the best way is actually to invest two days in setting up like that automation and then just let it run because that will do most of the job for us so certainly talking um where there are repetitive tasks because there's there's ways that automation can help you um, save time with that um and just being getting that best practice in as early as possible so we do a lot of training with our clients as well so rather than us get into this process of client does something on the website we come and say oh no 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 it needs to be like this and changing it and then them doing something and then paying us to come and essentially tell them off yes. like a school teacher <laughs> um it's much better if we have the conversation and say like here's the best practice here's the tool you need to use here's the process you need to follow we can give people this training and then it's just done right first time and maybe we check on it and give guidance so it would just be um yeah being open to to changing maybe the your internal process because it would be cheaper for you in the long run and that's ideally what an seo agency should be aiming for because although obviously at the end of the day we're we're paid to do anything we're asked to do i would rather us focus on things that are going to generate better results and just have other stuff done where we can get it done because if i can deliver good results people will reinvest and you know when when, when they see that Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I've sometimes uh, said to, to businesses that are kind of similar to, to you in that way that uh, there is a danger with waiting until you've planned everything to then say, oh, yeah, and we need some photographs uh, and we think we want this. And then I turn around and say to them, do you realise how complicated that is to, to create and to now engineer that back in so that you, oh, right, oh, I say it's a lot easier for me to help you if you involve me earlier in the process and it can save you planning, you know, going on a wild goose chase, planning something that's never going to be really achievable. Uh, I, I think in, in many ways, it's like you're saying with the SEO, if you can be brought in at the right sort of point, um, you can save a lot of waste. <laughs> yeah, 100 percent. Um, and I think that comes down to the kind of little bit of knowledge thing again, which is it's it's a really it's a really common trait in humans i think that when you know a little bit about something you overestimate how easy it is or underestimate how complex it is mm. and it's only when you start to specialize in something you realize oh actually there's there's mm. quite a lot of things in, involved here so definitely the same goes for photography and i've learned the same about um working closely over the years with developers and designers you know and it, it it's funny seeing it in different industries now um, or different specialisms, I should say, when we get maybe a client come back with a development request and it's attached with, oh, that's like a 10 minute job, right? You know, and, <laughs> and, and we're being asked essentially to move Jenga blocks that are at the bottom of a stack. And, it, you know, it's, it's definitely not a five minute job. And it, like you say, it would have been easier if we'd had that discussion earlier on and we mm. can build things accordingly. Yeah, I mean, you know, how you're going to structure your website, what's going to go where, all these sorts of things. You're then asking someone to put the foundations in after you've built the thing. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's kind of cut before the horse sort of thing, isn't it? Really? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's been really interesting um, delving into a little bit on that. And uh, I really appreciate your time for coming on and uh, recording this for us. Um, I would encourage people to take a look at Candor and take a look at Mark's um, unsolicited SEO tips on, on LinkedIn. Um, he also does SEO training and so on. So if you need to find out more, if this has whetted your appetite, then uh, please do get in touch. So thank you very much, Mark. No problem. Thanks for having me, Joe.